fields. So what we do is that we combine engineering undergraduate students, these days even high school students, and then women especially, um, to come to our lab and meet, we pick one disabled um, child, and that kid usually has some wish list, and then I ask the kid and says, well, if Santa Claus was an engineer, what are the 10 things that you really want from Santa Claus this, this winter? And they come up with the list. And about eight of those things are completely impossible to build. And two of those things, you know, something that we can imagine building with the team of um, pre-engineers. So we go in and build those things. And that builds a really nice sort of uh, bonding experience for everybody. And then that allows um, more people to pursue engineering and then increase the number of women in the field. Um, also, it turns out, high school students and undergrads have been publishing journal papers out of our lab because of these efforts. So that's really exciting. Um, this is the final slide with pictures. Um, everything I just talked about seems really far-fetched from the point of view of time. You know, the question Mike Mallon asked me earlier was like, so when can we start using your hand? Um, and who's, who's going to be wearing it first kind of questions. You know, I do my research in such a way that I try to reach out and try to solve problems that's, you know, going to be sort of um, uh, uh, the, the solutions that will be available in about 25 years' time. But, you know, that's, I, I also want to affect society today. And it seems that there are things that we can do to affect society. And then there are four quadrants of ways that I try to affect society today. And these are done through two companies that I'm starting, or I've started. Um, so one is really providing the robotic assistance now. Those things might not be publishable, but as I said, through outreach and so forth, we were able to make difference in people's life with the robotic technology. Um, through that, we are also trying to recruit more students and girls. This is, again, maybe we all do this, but cheap way to include our family photo um, <laughs> with our dog named Jalapeno. Um, and now that, I, now that we're living this crazy life of raising kids and doing engineering and then starting companies and all those things all at the same time, um, you know, I realized that this is really hard. This is why women don't pursue this field. Um, but can we actually, now that we know from this end how difficult it is, can we actually solve some of the problems so that more women can enter it? I actually have a company that allows that process to become easier. But not only that, I also try to help people who have chosen to just become full-time mothers to get back into the system. And finally, through all of this, I'm trying to provide a lifelong long learning opportunities for elderly. As the population is growing older, people want to keep learning. People want to keep contributing to the society in some way. And again, through some mechanism that one of the companies I have, um, um, we provide those opportunities and learning environment and the uh, ways for them to provide to the society. So if you're interested in learning more, those are my web pages. And thank you very much. Wow, that was so fascinating. I could have stayed here for hours. So next time we'll book you for 20 hours. It's so fascinating. Uh, we have a little time for a few questions. There are two microphones here, if you'd like to come to one of them, if anybody dares to ask anything. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very interesting that you know, the VA is putting in, and DARPA are also putting in quite a lot of money now. And you might have heard of a project called a revolutionary, not revolutionizing prosthetics. DARPA has just put in almost $40 million just to build an upper limb prosthetic device for people who are coming back from Iraq. Um, and the statistics is quite different these days. You know, in, after apparently World War II, um, there are more people who came back dead than came back with the paralyzed. But now it's the other way around. Medicine, you know, modern medicine has helped people to come back um, alive, but with permanent disabilities. So definitely there is a growing field in that. Um, still, from the VA's point of view, their current technology is to provide a hook that's as comfortable as possible. Um, but that is changing, and then hopefully we're, you know, we're contributing and changing that. But it's still a very slow-moving field at this moment. You've both paid uh, credit to teachers you've had in the past. Um, I'm interested in how mentoring really um, encourages people to go their own pathways. So I wonder if 
you both of you would talk about whether you met someone who really acted as a mentor for you in terms of um, taking ownership of where you wanted to go with your science. Well, so I've, I've had so many um, outstanding mentors and uh, I just feel completely uh, uh, blessed that way with mentors from, from here and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, UCSB as well as in, in business. Um, and uh, you know very well one of my, my mentors, Evelyn Hu, uh, who was my postdoctoral mentor, and I'm on the phone with her almost every, and I have two companies with her, on, on the phone with her uh, almost uh, every week. Uh, she still guides me and mentors me. So uh, I've been very, very lucky, and, and um, I also have a group of about 25 people, um, and then work with um, uh, between, well, uh, hundreds to 1,000 uh, K through 12 students um, a year. Um, and I mean, it's a if I hadn't had these really incredible mentors, I wouldn't be where I am today. And so, it's I, I strive to try to um, give that to to try to even be somewhat of a mentor. You know, it's hard to be compared to Evelyn Who, but um, to, back to other people. And so, it, it, it not only has the great mentorship um, helped me get to where I am today, but it always presses me to be a better and better mentor, knowing what what other people's time uh, has has given me. Um, and like I said, I just feel. Uh, uh, in incredibly blessed, and one of the most touching touching experiences I ever have, or when you know, from students I had as freshmen or high school students I had years ago, still send me letters all the time. I decided to go in this field because of you. Thank you for your the time that 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 you've you've given me, and I you know I get you know tens of those uh, a year, uh, and that means more to me than than you know any kind of award. Knowing that you've you've really had a positive influence um, in a young person's. Uh, uh, life or career, so it's it feels more rewarding for me than, than maybe it was for them. But yeah, uh, I think you know. There, so there are sort of two questions: like, what mentoring has really affected us the most, and then to me is sort of the encouragement. And you know, all of us feel insecure about us, right? And you know, at times you feel like eh, I'm not really really good at this, so I might just not do it. And those are the times that I think mentoring is extremely helpful to say, no, no, we believe in you, you know, go, 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 go. I think that really helps. So I think, you know, even people who, as a mentor, might, you might think are not, you know, doing so well, I think there are ways you can find to really encourage them. And I think those things are great. Um, from the other point of view, as a mentor, I think the thing that I found was that um, everybody's different. And you got us really, really sort of read into how they are and to mentor differently. And especially in the K-12, I've noticed that there are amazing students who just come to you all the time, but they're not the ones who are going to need the mentoring the most. You know, and then, so you have to kind of go and identify the ones who are not coming for questions, asking to come for mentoring, but to identify those people and then you're really trying to see how to get them to open up and then to explore themselves a little bit more. Those are the things that I've so far learned and I'm still learning how to do, so. Sally? Back there, Sally. I was, I was wondering what advice you would give um, students, freshmen here, if they were interested in pursuing either of your fields, what, what you see they should transfer to, what classes they should take, what they should focus on, just kind of advice for them if they were interested For me, what I always, uh, my advice always is, is for people to follow your passion. You know, find out what it is that you're so excited about that you can't, you can't sleep at night, you can't wait till first thing in the morning to work on that. And so that, that to me is, you know, I fell in love with molecules and it's been, it's, you know, I've never, I've never had much time to look, look back. And so that's always my first advice. Besides that, when I, when I accept students into my, my, I get about a 40 applicants a year of people that are already accepted my T4 applications into my group. And what I look for, and I accept about, about two to three, what I look for are people that are really good at something. I don't really care if they're really good at engineering or physics or biology, but just really good, you know, shown a very good um, track record and then have a, this, this great interest to get into, you know, whatever the field, like what, what they say, I really want to work on engineering biology to make, make materials. 
And then the other thing I look for is, is um, this sounds kind of strange, but, um, but humility, because someone that's willing to, to admit they know nothing about something and learn it from scratch. Uh, and so I really like that to get to go in. I really know nothing about you know, batteries, but then they get in there and they learn that. So uh, I think it's that drive, it's that passion um, that, that, um, that I, I recommend. But I really don't think it's, you know, my, my degree is in creative studies. Um, people never heard of that, and they're actually getting rid of my degree, I think. Um, and um, so I don't know if it really matters that much what, what, you, what, you, what you major in. I just don't think, you know, I, I think there's lots of different paths to the same place. Uh, and I think getting caught up in all those details, at least from my point of view, as you had mentioned uh, uh, before, you had all these different things that, that, that you're interested in, um, doesn't matter as much as just being, being really good at what, what you do and being, being passionate. Yeah. I think ditto, but um, <laughs> uh, one small thing to add might be that um, sort of the learning to learn, lear learning to how to learn information well might be the best thing to do in college. So things like, you know, if you learn to not pay attention to lectures in high school, like the, something I actually taught myself in high school not to pay attention because that was cool to do that, you know, like sit in the back and then just like chat up with friends and make fun of those geeks in the front um, kind of things. I got way too good at it and then I've really lost out. Um, I felt like, you know, what you can really learn in college is to, you know, to learn or to relearn how to really pay attention to the how to learn new information. And as long as you are really good at that, you can pick up whatever the information later. It doesn't matter what you might major in. You can major in English and then become an engineer at the end. You can major in engineering and you can become a politician at the end. So I think it's not about what, but how. Yes. In the back? No. You. Yeah. <laughs> I think she is very good at, good at the, the biology. I think that the, the, the biology is, has some trickier parts in, in the fact that you know, it, it's hard when you're putting it into a human. But, <laughs> but, but I would like to look into self-assembling electrodes for, the, for yeah. the brain. So that way you don't actually have to uh, do something that's, that's uh, you know, pull apart the skin. Maybe you can send it in and have them assemble at the surface. So I think that would be interesting. So yeah. <laughs> I know I'm not going to play her in tennis, so. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know about that these days, but yeah, I think in, in, in a way we kind of look at the problems in a very, it seems like it's different, but it's similar. We both are inspired by biology to make better technology. And, you know, she's in a micro scale and then I'm in a macro scale. But, you know, our philosophy is quite similar. Nick? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, and there are these days a lot of publications about that. So they all seem to blame on the image. So if you look at after elementary school, how well girls do in math versus boys, apparently girls are even a little bit better. But then by the time the end of junior year hits, where the puberty hits and boys are interesting and the girls are cute and all those things, then suddenly the, the, it's uncool for girls to be good in math and science. And that's the dramatic change. And it really seems that it's not an inherent ability or the intelligence. So that's really where we have to get in. We have to get in, in the, you know, between sixth through eighth grade to really change that image somehow. There's not a, the, you know, the obvious brilliant idea to change that at this moment. But we know at least that's when we need to get in. We need to have more role models that go in there and show that, hey, it's all right. It's, you know, it's still really cool to do this. And it's going to change the world. You know? And then it might be a little bit tough. Maybe people may pick on you for a little bit. But you know, it's, it doesn't matter. It's just really important. 
And yes, yeah, so I think that's one of the things that needs to happen. Um, I, I agree also um, completely, and it's a, partly an image. Um, and I, I'm working on some programs that, that I don't think are, are the answer, but um, the idea to um, make scientists and engineering uh, cooler um, through, um, through, through video and through uh, other um, media. But I think that we live in incredibly interesting times. I mean, we live um, in times where, where, um, where energy is such a huge um, topic that, you know, my, my son is, is not quite three years old, but we have energy conversations all the time. And, and, and it's, you know, the, the kids that come through my lab, they, they all are just in solar energy. And, um, but the same thing with, the, you know, the amazing uh, robotics and other kinds of medical applications. The, the kids that I meet, the ones that are in elementary school and junior high, boys and girls, are interested in, in these topics, making the world a better place, changing the world. And, you know, maybe the world was, it was too easy, or maybe, you know, our lives was, were too easy for, for a while. But now we have these, these challenges that are huge. And also in the environment, and kids are so engaged in, in stepping in. And so I think it's, it's you know, we need, to, we need to make, you know, they understand that importance. We need to make it, um, you know, cooler. We need to make it more accessible. And at MIT, we have qu quite a few women in, in engineering, in not as much faculty, but, but as undergraduates. In material science, one of my, my departments, we have, both my departments, we have more women than, than men undergraduates, mm -hmm. uh, both in, bi in bio -en biological engineering and in uh, in material science, we, we, we lose them in graduate school, and then we, we lose even more um, becoming faculty members. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good point about the biology, biology, biology infusion with engineering. So, you know, women somehow, girls want to help other people, like be, want to become a nurse, you know, want to do all those things. And then those things are now possible by pursuing engineering too. So I think that's another area that is really changing. We'll take one more question. No, 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 yes, I, I totally agree with you. So I think, um, so, so I think for those people who couldn't really hear the questions, I think he is really talking about can't things like you know an, the anatomical system be helped by the nanotechnology to the point that we can pretty much replace the things that degenerate over time with engineered solutions. You know, that's whether that day will come, I don't know, but. I think there are field, lots of fields are going that way. I think, I bet Angela and I have colleagues that we both know a lot about, um, you know, sort of overlap in our fields. Those people are working on nanotechnology in the neuroscience field. Um, you know, how do we actually put, place just the right amount of maybe stem cells or some technology nanotubes in a spinal cord where the injury occurred? Can we actually fix those things so that instead of having it go like just the way I do it, take it outside, do the processing and put it back in? But maybe we can actually fix the original problem itself. And just a, a couple of lines to add to that. One of the major um, places that my group is going now is towards self-healing uh, materials. Well, when I first started in this, this field, like I guess nine years ago, um, I had people call me and saying that this would, this would never work. And so the, the, what's the next thing? I said self-healing um, materials. And I actually wanted it for my Blackberry, because I'm always dropping my Blackberry and it's breaking. Uh, but, uh, but now people say, well, that's, that's a little bit out there. That's a little bit crazy. But, um, but I, think that it's, uh, I think it's doable, and I think a combination would be, would be very powerful. I would like to thank Angela and Yoki again so much. Thank you.